Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the second money management workshop and conference at the Zion Pilgrim Baptist Church. Today, we're going to really be engaged a little deeper in a discussion concerning your financial welfare. The Money, Manor, Mad Money Matters Conference. Thank you. This conference offers our members and friends a rare opportunity to delve into the unique challenges and opportunities that we are all facing financially. Participants in our last conference had dialogue concerning our finances and the legacy that we desire to leave for our children and our grandchildren. The Congregation Care and Keep Ministry is excited to bring this conference back to you a second time so that we can delve and dig deeper into the cornerstones of financial planning. To Zion Pilgrim and to our online followers again. There is no doubt that in the last two and a half years that COVID-19 has impacted our spending habits of a super rich society and ours and all the people around the world. We continue to see that the ultra high net worth investors informed by many uncertain people out there in the world looks for an alternative asset class of diversity of portfolios, those wonderful plans that you have made, hopefully, since our last visit together. And hopefully, these plans will provide some uh, resilient returns to you throughout the different stages of the pandemic as well as your lives. This conference today will share valuable insights to you and your thinking processes should con and things that you should consider as from the international and our local perspectives look at our finances and have them before us in our view. Our local speaker today from South Carolina, from Columbia, South Carolina, and she's visiting us in Rich Tech, uh, will equip our, our uh, attendees here today and those online with strategies that will empower you to manage your money in the area of gaining a higher asset capacity. And these are the areas that we're going to look at as we move forward. Cash management and liabilities will increase your cash flow. Investment education savings accounts, guaranteed income solutions, and risk tolerance assessments. Protection through health insurances may be discussed today. Disability income and the beneficiaries reviews. What you're gonna do with your beneficiaries and your children for the future. This umbrella of strategic benefits can empower and better and, and just better serve us to understand the dynamics, all the dynamics of our now and future financial needs. We must find our niche in the financial market, marketplace for having success in financial planning, 
for ourselves and our children and our children's children. The CCKM, the Congregation of Care and Keep Ministries, is providing another opportunity for you to relax, learn, to grow with us as our financial partner, Minister Rosalind L. Glenn of the Destiny Wealth and Consulting LLC is with us. She is a trusted financial manager, accounting professional, one who also encourages community development, investors, and lenders to build skills, share their financial vision by teaching lessons in the workshops and conferences that she provides to provide us the consultation services that we may personally need, encourage our clients that work with us in different ministries here at Zion Pilgrim, and to inspire the needs for your changing the way you operate and operate your personal budgets, personally or in business matters, investing and saving and sharing a network of ideas with our members here in this meeting today and online to renew your financial energy for the challenges that we will face. This conference program examines the key trends shaping the future of investment with advice and solutions with an exciting mix of three keynote presentations, focus sessions, and, a, and plenty of time for one-on-one -on -one or group conversations. Reserve your spot today when you leave for the final investment advisory conference in 2023. The conference of 2023 may be the most important gathering of the new year. This conference will bring to us focus how your children and your grandchildren will secure the legacy that is now your making. According to a recent COVID-19 uh, research, only in, uh, increased the coffers. When I said coffers, I was thinking about coffers. But that's not the coffers that we're talking about today. We're talking about the strong chest box that holds your valuables, your documents, and all that thing that the, in the past, people told us to stick it under the bed until you need it. We're not sticking anything under our beds until we need it. We're going to look today for the future so that we can be wealthy and that we can be good servants of God, what God has given us. The pandemic unleashed pent-up demands resulting in a spending frenzy. Uh, that, that pandemic by the rich, they took their money, they bought fine wine and whiskey and diamonds and classic cars and all the altern alternative assets and invested in it. What have we invested in? What have we done? What have the pandemic made us do that we don't traditionally do? Bloomberg, let me tell you what he says. He predicts that cask whiskey, the things of this world, was one of the biggest alternatives of investments since the pandemic struck us in 2021. That's just a few months past. They're investing their money in their causes. So we need to step it up. While the, lit, the live X fine wine 1000 suggests that the value of fine wine has shot up 200% since the pandemic. There's a lot of wine drinking <laughs> going on. <laughs> Over, and and the, the, that can be related to 10 years of financial planning and the lack of money investments in our lives. 
So we need to plan for our future. And with no further ado, if you look at your agenda, we will have our conference opening prayer by Sister Mavis Harper. And if you want to read more, you can open your packets and you can see uh, the bio of our wonderful sister, Minister Rosalind L. Glenn. Thank you, Mavis. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this day, Lord God. This is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it, Lord God. We rejoice today, Lord God, that we have life, Lord God, that we have your breath in our lungs, Lord God. We rejoice today, Lord God, for the sun shining, Lord God, the warmth of the sun, the chill of the cool air this morning that we can feel, Lord God. We rejoice, Lord God, that we can say your name. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord God. We bless your name, Lord God. You said, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. We know, Lord God, that all of our help comes from you. And we can't move, Lord God. We can't speak, Lord God, until you speak, until you move. So, Holy Spirit, we invite you in. You are welcome. Prepare our hearts. Open our ears to what you have to say for us, Lord God. Make us attentive, Lord God. In the name of the Lord Jesus, you said you've given us everything that pertaineth to life and godliness. So we have come for such a time as this to be educated, to be informed, to be better stewards of what you have given us and to leave an inheritance for our children and our children's children. Lord God, we thank you for Reverend Glenn. We thank you, Lord God, for the years of preparation. We thank you, Lord God, for the years of experience. We thank you, Lord God, for the years of wisdom, Lord God. But Lord God, we thank you most of all for your spirit that lives in her. That she has an ear to hear your voice, Lord God. Now we ask you, Lord God, to strengthen her, Lord God, and give her everything that you would have us to hear today. May this information fall on good ground. May nothing come and choke it or pluck it up. But may we prosper because we have been here today. We give you glory, Lord God. We give you honor, Lord God. And we love you, Lord God. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So hello, everybody. Hello. I am so excited to be here. Um, it's always such a sweet spirit when I come and share with you all today. And so I am grateful for that. I was telling them um, I was at prayer at my church this morning before I came here. And so I'm, I am full, and, and I hope I can stay focused and, um, and, and teach, because I came to teach today. But I, I feel so empowered to share this information, because I do believe it is the will of God that we, his children, prosper, as his word says, and be in good health. And, and, and we have to figure this out, right? We have to figure this thing out about how we're managing the resources that he gives us. We, we heard um, a, a lot uh, about you know, the assets, and, and Sister Brightstone gave us some really good information, right, about how the economy is working. And we are a part of this economy, and we've got to take our rightful place in this economy and use the resources that are in our hands to do what we need to do as kingdom citizens, which is to try and build God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. 
And so I am excited to be here today. Um, I want this, as always, to be interactive. I know we've got folks that are watching um, with us online, and so we're going to have um, somebody managing the chat box as we go. So feel um, empowered to kind of, you know, send us in the questions. I'll, I'll be looking at Brother Jamie every now and then to say if we got some questions, and, and we'll ask those questions out loud, and we will try to provide the information. My goal is always to give you information that you can take away today and put into action today. I don't do these workshops just for the sake of standing up in front of people, but I am on the mission that I believe that the Lord has given for my life to empower people in their financial areas. Um, and as was read in the information today, COVID exposed a lot to us about a lot of things. And one of the things was how unprepared we are in our financial matters. And when folks start leaving here unexpectedly, it just creates a whole lot of chaos. And, and it, it sometimes even um, in my 30 year experience in this financial industry world, it has shown me the hearts of people, really, <laughs> because that's what it boils down to. And so today, um, we, we're going to share a lot of information today. We are going to still be talking about these cornerstones of financial planning. Um, if you remember our last session, we talked mostly about budgeting and why it was important to have a budget and to give your money a plan and tell your money what you want it to do for you rather than letting your money tell you what you can do and when. So we're going to kind of still build off of that today and we're going to talk a little bit more about your estate and, and what you have. You all have... Uh, some of us have, have worked all of our lives, and we have built up something, right? And and when we leave here, we want to be in charge of telling, you know, our assets where we want them to go and what we want them to do to sustain our families, because that's at the end of the day what we want to make sure we're doing. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this whole estate planning and and what does that need, what does that mean, um, and why you need one. I don't care what level of income you have. If you own anything, you need to have a will, you need to have your estate set up, um, depending on the complexity of what you own, you may even need to consider a trust and setting up a trust. And so we're going to talk about that, right? We're going to talk about, you know, what do you need and why do you need estate planning, right? Why do, why do we need to think about this? We, we live these lives we go to work, we work hard every day, um, we get to a place of retirement, and, and retirement, folks, doesn't necessarily mean that you stop working, because I think, you know, most of us in this room, I'm looking at some folks who are retired, but they would say that they're probably working harder now than when they were actually working, right? Because we live life, and as long as we have breath in our body as kingdom citizens, we are required to continue to be building. So even when we get to a point of retirement, we are still going to be working to do some things which is going to require resources to do it, right? And so we want to make sure we understand that estate planning is not just about taxes. And because if you don't dispose of your estate properly, you may end up paying a whole lot more money in taxes than you need to because you haven't put it in the right order, right? There is such a thing as an estate tax, right? Mm -hmm. Now, most of us are going to not have to deal with that estate tax because I believe you got to have about $11, $11 million in assets to get there. Um, however, you still want to make sure that you're disposing of your assets in a way that is beneficial to yourself and to your family. And we want to talk about the fact that estate planning is not just about having a will and or trust. Those are important things, and I implore you to put them in place. But what's more important is what is your legacy going to be? What are people going to say about you when you leave this earth, right? And, and what they say about you when you leave is determined by what you're doing right now while you're living, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so you are building your legacy every single day of your life. We've heard ministers preach about the dash, right? We know that the dash is the most important part of what's going to be on your tombstone. What did you do in the dash, right? 
And and a part of that, from my perspective as a financial advisor, is 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 putting your resources to work for you in a way that speaks to what mattered to you while you were living. I can tell everything right now that matters to you if you give me about 15 minutes to just scroll through your bank account. I don't have to know who you are. I don't have to know anything else about you. But if you just let me scroll through your bank account and look at how you're spending your money, I can tell you what's important to you. Because most of us spend our money on matters and things that are important to us. Now, a lot of times when I start my whole, um, you know, financial advising and, and I meet a client for the first time, um, one of the things that I say to them, I ask them, you know, to tell me what's important to you. And almost inevitably, they say things like, you know, making sure that I can take care of my family, uh, making sure that I can get my kids educated, um, making sure that I can, you know, have a roof over their head, making sure um, that I've got some money saved up for a rainy day. They, these are common things. These are things you would say, right? <laughs> these are the, all things that all of us generally, because we're no different, we would all say these same things. And then I say, well, just, not, then I ask the question, well, pull up your bank account and just let me see. And I just scroll through. And, and, and I say, well, you said to me that educating your, or, you know, making sure that your child got an education was important to you. But I don't see anywhere where you're sending even $25 to a savings account to save it for your child to be educated. So is that really important to you, right? I see you shopping. I see you eating out a lot, right? I see you going to the football games and the basketball games. I see you spending a lot of money um, on boating or fishing. You know, I see you, 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 you playing golf every week. I see that going to the golf course every week, right? So if these things are really important to you, then you would do the things that matter, right? And, and so we've got to make sure that we have these things in place, right? we got to make sure that we know who do you want to inherit your assets, right? If you own anything, because that's what an asset is. An asset is anything you own. So houses, cars, bank accounts, jewelry. Um, you know, any other real estate kinds of, 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 of investments that you may have, all of that is things that you own. So what's going to happen to that when you leave? Who's going to take care of it? Who do you want to take care of it, right? Which assets should you pass on? And how should you pass that on? And when should you pass it on? When we start understanding the rules around um, Social Security and we start understanding the rules around Medicare and Medicaid and when you can get help or if you need help and how sometimes even owning stuff prohibits you from getting the assistance that you may need and so at what point is it time to start passing on and re um, you know giving the, the, the things that you own to your legacy right so that you can make sure that you have the help that you need as you live. So these are all things that you got to think about, you know. And there are there are some consequences for not planning, y'all. There are there are some consequences for not getting things done. There are some consequences for not making sure that you have things in place. There are some real consequences for not getting to um, a good place in your own mind about that. And I believe, because we, how many of you have heard the saying, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people? Mm -hmm. We say that, right? Mm -hmm. And then we won't prepare to die. <laughs> we won't prepare to go there. So all of this, to me, is spiritual, right? It's, it's, it's all connected to the will of God and what he plans for our lives. There are consequences to not planning. It just kind of means that your assets will end up getting determined by the state because even if you don't have a will guess what you do you have a will because the state will decide on your behalf where your assets go and who gets them and it normally starts with the secession of your your bloodline your family your husband your wife your children your sisters your brothers your parents if you don't have children there is already a an order of secession if you will as to how the state will dispose of your assets which may not be what you want. 
It may not be what you desire. So take the time. Spend the time sitting down. I tell my clients, because nobody likes to talk about death and dying. I know. I know. It's, it's a tough thing to talk about. What happens when I'm no longer here? It's a tough conversation to have. But I say to my clients, we got to have this conversation. It may take us 30 to 45 days to have this conversation. And once we have it, we don't have to have it again. Because we will have put things in place and we'll only need to talk about this again if we need to change something. Because we all know that life changes and life happens. And as we are planning, as we're making concessions for the things that we want to happen, um, as we are taking care of our business, you know, sometimes right in the middle. Can't tell you the number of times that I have been right in the middle of writing up a plan for a client um, in terms of what we're going to do. And then something happens in the middle of that plan and we have to make the adjustments. Like maybe we lose a loved one while we're planning to care for that loved one, right? There may be any number of things that we can do um, or, or that will happen. But the idea is to make sure that we plan. And particularly parents, if you have children, if you love your child, you want to make sure that you have a plan, that you have had a conversation with somebody that you have sat down and said, if something happens to me and my child's other parent, here we would like you to be responsible for that. I don't take that 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 responsibility lightly, right? I, I have godchildren, and, and and I have other children who claim to be my godchildren because I don't take that. When when parents sit down and ask me, that is a responsibility, and I take it serious. And I have the conversation with them, and I say we got to put some things in place right now because I don't mind caring for your children, but we got to have resources to do that. So if you want me to do that. Let's put some things in place for me to do that, for you to do that. And then as your child lives and grows older, then you even then have an asset that you can pass on to them because prayerfully they get to be able to grow up into their older years. And now what you were planning to protect them with becomes something that you plan to provide for them with because you can make it them, you're a part of your legacy. So we got to think about all of these things. We got to think about the things that um, estate planning can help you with. It, it helps you to to address the concerns about taxes. Yes, it does. It helps you to determine if you need a simple will or if you need a trust. We've talked about that, right? It helps you think about really who do you want to have what. And let me say this because again, this is from my thirty year experience, and it is it is no indictment on anyone specifically but it's a real issue that there's always going to be maybe one, maybe two people in your family that you can trust to do what you want them to do. You're not going to be able to trust everybody to do that. And particularly parents with children, I see the struggle sometimes of wanting to be equal and wanting to make sure everybody gets the same thing. And that is noble. That really is noble. But let me tell you what I've seen happen. I've seen the equality and the children get it and, and the one who has never been responsible is still not responsible and the other two end up having to make sure because we're family, we're not going to let you just be out on the street, right? But you get your inheritance and you do like the, uh, the son that asked for his inheritance early and he went out and squandered it, right? And then he came to a census and now he's back wanting to do something different. You know, and so, you know, I, I, I felt the way about the brother that stayed home. I'm, anybody else going to be honest with me about that? Look, I've been here. <laughs> I've been doing the work. I've been responsible. And you're going to throw a party for them. And you're going to leave me over here. <laughs> you know, and I'm, that's a human response. I'm not saying it's a right response. I'm just saying it's a human response. And, and that's how we as humans work and function and act and live. But we got to, it, it, I've had to say to some parents, no, you can't, you can't leave this to that one. You have told me that they're not responsible. You have told me that they're not going to be able to do, thank you so much. You have told me that they're not going to do and be responsible. So let's leave it to the responsible one and give them um, instructions on how to care for. That's noble. That's noble. Thank you.
you so much. That's noble. And, and so these are the things that, you know, we, we got to have these conversations. Hard conversations to have, right? We got to have them. But all of these things are a part of a comprehensive plan. Um, it's, it's, it's a part of what I do every day to help us be realistic about how we need to set things up and, and how um, everything needs to be transferred. And let's talk a little bit about that, how things are kind of transferred um, at death. I want to have that conversation because I think it's important information to share with you all, right? You always are going to have to go through probate. Whenever anybody passes away, you have to go to probate. You cannot avoid going through probate. But what you can do is make the probate process easier. And you make the probate process easier by having a will. Because if there's a will, the only thing you got to do is go down to the probate court, fill out the information, and submit the will, and then do what the will says to do. And then report back to the probate court that you have carried out and show them that you have carried out what was in the will. They're going to close the probate after 9 to 12 months and it's going to be a done deal. It's going to be over. It's, it's really that simple. But when you don't have that in place, now we got some issues, right? <laughs> now we got to think about some things, right? We got to figure these things out. There's a question. I have a question. How long... Does the will last from what? How many years? As long as it is. It, if, you, if you do a will on, say, 2013, how long is that will? Um, in no, effect. In effect yes. That will is in effect okay. indefinitely okay. until you change it. And when you change it, because here's the other thing I'll say about a will is you want to make sure that you have filed it and that it is on record. Now you can do that, you can have a will and just have somebody notarize it and have it signed off on and witnessed and, and that will make it effective. But if you really want it to be effective, you want to put it on file at the, at the courthouse and have it on file at the courthouse. But that will will stay in effect indefinitely until another will is, take, takes that place. A will be contested? Absolutely can. Yes, ma'am, it can. A will can be contested. The question was, can a will be contested? I forgot we got online people and people in the room. Um, so I'll repeat the question. The question was, can a will be contested? It absolutely can be contested. And in some instances, that's where it prolongs the process. Because now you got to wait until you get the court dates before you can dispose of any of the assets because the will has been contested. But let me tell you what avoids that contestation, right? Having it in order. Because even if somebody contests it and you've got everything in order, the courts are going to say, on what grounds are you contesting this? And if there's no grounds for it, it's going to be dismissed and your wishes are going to be carried out. So that is the, the reason for putting those things in place and making sure that you have those things in place, right? And although I'm saying that everything has to, has to be, or everybody has to go through the probate process, all of your assets do not have to. Here's where it becomes important in how you have things titled and what beneficiaries you have on your documents. And if you don't have any beneficiaries on any of your bank accounts, on any of your, uh, or you don't have your assets titled properly, then they all end up in your estate, which is then how that has to be divvied out. So how do you help that process? Put beneficiaries on everything. Decide now who you want to get the proceeds from your life insurance. Who do you want to get the proceeds from your 401k accounts, your 403b accounts, your TSB accounts? Put those on there now. Have a transfer on death on your bank accounts or a payable on debt. That doesn't give them access to your bank account. It just gives them access once you are deceased because that those funds in that account will automatically transfer payable on debt, transfer on debt once you're deceased. Those funds don't necessarily have to go through the probate because you have already outlined what you want to happen. Now you do have to list them 
as a part of the asset because it is an asset that's owned by the person, but you've already d decided who you want that asset to go to. Question. Yes. Um, um, does that protect um, you from having to pay your liabilities? Like if you mm -hmm. owe someone a bill? No, ma'am. Mm -hmm. No, ma'am. Okay, that's what I was talking We're we, we going to talk about that. If you look, look, the only way not to, to get out of paying somebody is to pay them. If you owe a lot, <laughs> if you owe it, you owe it. Now, so placing a, a beneficiary on your account doesn't protect. No, ma'am. Okay. If you have liabilities, because because you've got to pay your liabilities. So, for instance, nobody can make me pay your liabilities. I'm not responsible for paying your liabilities. But if you have assets, your assets have to pay your liabilities. And then whatever is left over is what we divvy up. You can't say just because she dead, <laughs> she can't pay you and we ain't going to pay you. Well, if you own a home, your family could end up out on the street. Because if, 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 my, if, if it's me... And the name is the, the home is in my name and, and say my mother's name um, because I don't have a spouse. So if the if the asset is in my name and my mother's name, and I am the one deceased, fifty percent of the value of that home belongs to me. That is a part of my estate. If I still have a mortgage on that property, and my mother lives in that property, the property still has to be paid for. So they got to figure it out. <laughs> In comes my shameless plug for why you need life insurance. <laughs> because if my mother's not able to pay that mortgage, but she needs to live there, then I need to have an insurance policy on me that pays my house off when something happens to me so she can still have somewhere to live. Are you seeing how these things are designed to work? $25,000 worth of life insurance is not enough. We think about life insurance as just something to bury me with. Well, if you have liabilities, you need more than something to bury you with. If you live in a two-income household and one of those income goes away, how does your family live? Your life insurance, leaving that, at least leave them you know, if, if you're making $50,000 a year, at least leave them two years worth of your salary. <laughs> you know, leave them something so they can get back on their feet and make decisions and do what they need to do to manage because you're no longer there providing that income. Does that make sense to everybody? These just, these just thank you for the question, and, and it gets a little bit ahead of where we are, but I'm here for you today. So let's answer the questions. Yes, ma'am. We were talking about simple wills and contestants. What are the grounds for contestants? Who can and who cannot? Anybody can, can. I can contest your will, and I don't even know you, ma'am. <laughs> Anybody can contest the will, but the point that I was saying is. What, on what grounds? You've got to have grounds, and when it goes to court, that, those are, that's what the court is going to be trying to decide. Mm -hmm. On what grounds are you contesting this? So I can tell you what I've seen. I've seen children contest the wills of their parents because they feel like they should have gotten something more than what the parents left them. But again, if it was in the will and the will was carried out, Sorry. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that is the importance of putting that in place, that they can't contest it. But if they don't have the grounds and, and we go through due process and demonstrate that everything was carried out in decency and in order according to what the plans were, then there is no grounds. There is no grounds. So why, why do you need a will, right? <laughs> For that very reason right there. For that very reason right there. We have to make sure that we have outlined 
what we want to happen with our assets. And, 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 and I'll say this just as an aside, you do want to try to be fair and just in, in your, but, but here's the thing about fair and just. They're my assets. I have worked for them. I get to decide what I want to do with my assets. So what's fair and just is whatever I want to do with my assets. <laughs> right? And so when we start kind of talking about family and, and people feeling entitled, because there's such a spirit of entitlement, right? There's such a spirit of, you know, I, I, you owe me this. And, and the word tells us that we don't owe anybody, we shouldn't owe anybody anything except to love them. That, that is the kind of life we want to try to live, right? To, to, not to owe anybody anything except to love them. Now, financially, I know that we probably can't live in the houses that we live in if we don't get a mortgage. We probably can't, um, you know, drive the cars that we drive if we're not able to get a loan to pay. Some people are, are exceptionally blessed and they can just go pay for cash for a car. That's not my testimony. I'm going to have to go to the bank, borrow some money, and pay on it over time. But I'm going to pay the people what they tell me I need to pay. And then I'm going to do it on time. And then I'm going to ask for my title once I've paid it off, right? So that's, that, those are fair things. Back to the question of the liabilities. You, you can't get out of your liabilities. If you sign a contract, which is what a loan is, to, to borrow money, you got to honor that. That's, that's integrity, right? And you should put provisions in place that when I'm no longer here, I know I still owe my mortgage. This right here is set aside just to pay off this mortgage. Now, Y'all can sell the house once, you know, because nobody said, I live in Columbia. My family lives in, up in, 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 I'm from Wellford, South Carolina, a proud little country girl. Uh, but my, my, my family lives up there. I don't anticipate that any of them are going to move down to Columbia. They could, but I don't want them stressing out about making payments on my house until they figure out what to do with it. So go ahead and get it paid off and then take your time and figure out how you're going to dispose of it. Yes, ma'am. How, how does, uh, when we make large purchases, like houses, cars, and things like that, when we make large purchases, like houses and cars, and we always offer these insurance packages, how does this fit into our plan? So, thank you for that question, because it's a rele relevant question. If I've already got things in place, because mm -hmm. I do, then I generally decline those things because you pay more for them. Okay. They cost you a whole lot more and they increase your payment and um, sometimes you got to read the fine print they don't always do what they say they're going to do. So I'm not suggesting that you never get it but what I am suggesting is that you review and understand what you're getting because if you don't have things in place, then you may want to go ahead and pay that extra money so that it can be paid off. Because some of that is credit liability insurance is what that's called. Mm -hmm. Credit liability insurance, they offer to you on cars, even on credit cards sometimes. You can get that where that the balance will be paid off in the event of your decease. Um, but you want to read the fine print and understand it. Now, the reason I'm not a fan of it for credit cards is because I don't carry credit card debt. And you pay that even if you don't have a balance on that credit card. Mm -hmm. But if you carry the balance, then it might be beneficial for you if you don't have your money saved up. Because if you got your emergency savings in place and you don't have a very high balance and something happens to you, then they can just take your asset, your savings account, Pay that credit card balance, and it's gone away, and I haven't had to pay extra on for credit disability or credit life because. So does it does it make sense to everybody how it's relative based on your situation? Because some people I might advise not to get it. Other people I may advise you need it because you have a, you don't you haven't firmed up your foundation. 
So if you've got a firm financial foundation, and remember we talked last time about what that was, you got income coming in, you got your emergency savings in place, you've got your debt reduction strategy in place, you've got your investment strategy in place, got your retirement plan in place, you got your legacy plan in place. You got all of that in order and you're buying stuff, then it may not be necessary because you've already made provision to take care of that debt. Does that, does that kind of help? Yes, yes ma'am. One last question. I know uh, in this scenario, husband and wife, husband, um, husband passed, wife's name is not on the car. This is how the car. He has no will. She has no will. What happens in that case? Is she liable for his debt? She, she is not liable. None of us are liable for anybody else's debt. Okay. But if his if they own property mm -hmm. and his name is on the property. Her name is not on the property. Okay, so th that's the scenario I just gave you. Unfortunately, with the house, if, if his name was on the property, mm -hmm. on the house, and on the car, and only his name, and hers is not anywhere, she don't have a place to stay. Okay, we're talking, let's, I, I'm thinking about a special situation with a car. Husband did not have a will. His wife's name is not on the car. Mm -hmm. Is she liable to pay for that car? She, she, she's not necessarily liable to pay for that car. She's liable to run his, pro, his assets through probate, mm -hmm. which, con, which includes the house, which is why I'm talking about the house, and 50% of that house has to be used to pay off that car. Okay. That. Yeah, yeah. And so, so what? What the? What the? Um, and 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 most of the time, creditors don't go to this extent, but they could. They will attach a lien to her property, and she won't. If, if either she's got to sell that property, oh, she'll know it. Because most people, do, they cannot. Most people don't understand this. People cannot attach liens to your stuff without your knowledge. Mm -hmm. And if they do without the knowledge, what happens? They they can't do it without your knowledge because in the fine print, in the fine print, whenever you take out a liability, in the fine print, they tell you this is what we're going to do if you don't pay us. So they can't do it with. It. That's why they put it in the fine print. You owe us this money. If you don't pay us, these are all of the things that we can do. Repossess the property, you know, place a judgment against you, which is which is what a lien is. All of that is always in all those documents that we never read, and we just they say sign here, sign here, sign here, and we just sign, 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 sign. You are signing saying that you understand that this is what's gonna happen. So it's no you can never not know. Because if, if it's not been paid for, you got to know they, they have a right to do something. Because you owe them the money. And, and maybe not you directly, but whoever, which is why that's a great question. Because do you see how not having your stuff in order impacts the whole family? Yes. And we, in our community in particular, lose so many of our assets that our grandparents worked hard to keep in the family for somebody to always have a place to come home to. But because we are being irresponsible, and that's the only word I can think to use these days because it's happening more and more often and it's breaking my heart to see because we won't be responsible. You gotta pay people if you borrow their money. Point blank period, always. Before you take out a loan from anybody, <laughs> you got to make sure that you have the ability to repay it. And if you don't, you put your family at jeopardy. Does that make sense to everybody? We're up on our time, and I think we've got about a, uh, um, and I'm not even halfway through this, but right. this is good discussion, yeah. and I hope it's helping. I hope it's helping. So we're going to take a, what, five minutes? We're going to take a five-minute break. Five-minute break, and then I'll be right back before you. No, I'm not. 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 I'm
this is good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to do here, so we won't have to be moving around. We're going to go ahead and give you your lunch, so you can snack between. Jamie, I didn't ask you if you had questions online. <laughs> Okay. 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 Gotcha. Yeah, I don't know. 
Hello there. We know that you're having a wonderful time today engaging in conversation about your financial health and it's time for us to come back to the podium once again and start with our wonderful facilitator today and uh, we're about ready to begin. Thank you. 
All right, so so thanks a lot. Um, good discussion, and this is what I want. I, I, I'm not even halfway through the presentation, but I am okay with that because I am answering your questions um, and helping you to kind of understand the process. Because what I know about us, you know, our, our community, and I'm speaking specifically of, of the black community now, a lot of our challenges, I believe, are because we don't know. And we know that the word tells us that people perish for lack of knowledge. Yes. And so I am just here to share the knowledge that I have gained over these 30 years in this industry. Um, and, and I try, I, I am intentional about staying up to date and abreast and learning because in this financial industry, things change by the day. <laughs> and, and things are impacted by the laws that are put in place which is, again, why I'll make a shameless plug about why you need to participate in the voting process. Because the people that are in position make decisions that impact your lives. And so understand that um, and, and understand how this whole system is connected. We cannot be, as kingdom citizens, trying to operate outside of the processes that have been put in place, right? And so we got to understand all of this and how all of this works um, so that we can be aware of how it impacts us even in our own houses, right? Um, and so let's let's keep talking here about, you know, this why we need a, a, a will and what, what that entails, right? So every, every person that is listening to me right now, um, every person in this room, these three documents you need to have. A durable power of attorney, a health care power of attorney, and a will. The durable power of attorney gives somebody that you trust the ability to manage your affairs in the event that you are incapacitated, which means that you can't make decisions for yourself and you're not dead, <laughs> but you're still here. And, and, and somebody needs to make those decisions for you. Somebody needs to manage your financial matters while you are still um, in the hospital in a coma. Your mortgage still got to be paid, right? All of that stuff still has to happen. And so a durable power of attorney names someone that can do that in your state. And I tell people often, there has to be, there has to be, y'all, at least one person that you can trust. And and, and if, that ain't, if that's not your testimony, then I encourage you to start living a better life. <laughs> because the Bible says that if we're going to have friends, we got to show ourselves friendly. And if we show ourselves friendly, there is somebody that we can trust. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a family member. I can't tell you the number of people that have told me. Now, I'm a fiduciary, and I don't, I can't, I can't be on anybody's, I can't be the person responsible for anybody else's stuff because of the role that I play. But people have said, Roz, I'm going to need you to make sure. And I said, the only way that you can make sure is to get a will in place, <laughs> put a door of a power attorney in place, and have a health care power of attorney in place, right? Yeah. So you want to have all of that stuff in place so that your things will go the way you want them to go. The health care power of attorney gives somebody the permission to make decisions about your health care on your behalf when you are not able to do that. And you want to have conversations with these people and let them know what your wishes are. So they're not in a limbo trying to figure out, you know, would she want me to do this? What, what quality of life do you want to live? You know, I have I have told people, I, if, if I can't help and do for myself, and you got to decide, you know, if they say, well, well she, she'll she live, but she's going to be in this state always, then let me, I, I plan to see Jesus. I'm going to be fine. Let me go. <laughs> right? Yes, ma'am. Um, question. On the durable power of attorney and the health care power of attorney, is there, um, once you put that in place, is that forever, or you can change it, or? You can change these documents as long as you're alive and in right state of mind to change them. And, and I, I'm going to use the term that right state of mind because dementia and Alzheimer's, 
are those diseases are there. So so you when we know most of those diseases are progressional, and we got to deal with it on the front end of it. When we see it happening, we got to have those conversations then. Mm -hmm. And, and just in case, because when it gets to a place where they are not able to make the decisions, then you can't even put these things in place. It's hard to put them in place, right? Because if, if, if me and, and my brother and my sister, we're not all on one accord, then I might take mama down here and we do this today. My brother might take and she change it tomorrow. My sister might take and she change it the next day, right? So you got to start having those conversations up front. Yeah. And this paperwork, you get it from a um, the state. Um. So I am a proponent of using an attorney. Now I'm you and letting it be an estate planning attorney. Don't go get a criminal lawyer to put your estate paperwork together. Now understand what they do. And that's where you got to do your due diligence and get somebody that works in that field, that studies it, that understands it, that knows it. Now, there are other ways that you can also put these things in place that I'm not necessarily um, a fan of because if we don't, you, you need to talk to somebody that knows and that you trust. Right? You got to do your due diligence. Same thing I tell people about working with financial advisors. I would love to help everybody, but if you don't trust me, don't work with me. Work with somebody that you trust and you are willing to be open and vulnerable with to give them your information and that you trust to do the right thing by you. In these capacities, we have what we call a fiduciary responsibility to always look out for the best interest of the client. In our humanity, that ain't always the case. So, get an, a, a, an estate planning attorney. In, it's an, to me, it's an investment. Most of us think about it as an expense. It might cost you $500 to $750 to get these documents in place. But let me tell you, it is well worth the cost to get them in place and, and have them in place and not have to worry about it. As, as we move forward into 2023 conversations, the young man that we're going, we may bring in, that will be his... Role. Absolutely, yes, yes. We have already discussed about bringing in an estate planning attorney to have this conversation more in depth um, because that's his field. That, that's not, not even what I do. I just know enough about it. Uh, I tell people to be dangerous because I need to know about it to be able to advise my clients. But when we get down to the nitty gritty, I turn them over to an estate planning attorney. And I have relationships with several. And I say talk to all of them and figure out who you want to do business with. But these are people that I know that I have been able to trust and believe that they will do and handle you the way I try to handle you. So it's a referral source. So look forward to 2023. Yeah. I saw another hand, I thought. Nope. Then let's, let's go ahead and um, talk about um, why, you, why you might consider a trust versus a will, right? Um, if you don't want people to know about your assets and what you own, then the trust is the way to go. Because the trust is, is private. More or less, you, you develop a trust, you work with an attorney, you set it up, and all of your assets end up in the trust, and the trustee is the only person that has the responsibility of managing your assets the way you have outlined them to be managed. So for people who have more complex, I say, um, financial situations, maybe you own multiple properties, um, maybe you have you know a business, um, maybe you have, um, you know, billions of dollars and you want you know it to go separate places in different ways um, then you may consider setting up a trust to be able to manage that and the thing about a trust is you can set the trust up while you're living mm -hmm. and, and, and let the trust pay you to live and then it automatically goes you know it, it's going to carry out your wishes um, the way you, you want them to go and I won't get into 
uh, you know, the, the living trust, the revocable trust, the irrevocable trust, because that's way outside of my scope of, um, of information. But just know that all of those things are there and in place and that you can set those things up and have opportunities for them, um, you know, to be able to, to do what you want them to do for yourself and for your family. Okay? Any questions about that piece? The, how you decide whether or not you need a will or a tr everybody needs a will. I'm, I'm going to start there. Everybody, everybody needs a will. And if nowhere else, start there. And then let you, once you work with your, um, the person who you want to talk to, they may advise based on their knowledge that, you know, your assets are a little bit more complicated. We really need to be talking about putting a trust in place. And if you have, um, special needs people is, is how I'll say that. You need a trust because if you care for somebody, you're providing for their care, what happens to them and their care if you are no longer here? So you want to put that money in a trust with directives on what to do, care for this person I've been caring for, whether it's a parent caring for a child or, you know, the roles are changing, whether it's a child now caring for a parent, right? Because life is happening all around us. We, we all, we used to think that you know, I may leave here, or, or my parents may leave here before me, but that ain't the case. We have friends losing parents every day, and, and, or, 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 or parents losing children, let me see, every day. And so you, we, we don't know. So get, get it in order is, is all I'm going to say there. Question. Yes, um, this, is, it's, uh, this question is concerning a husband and wife. Maybe the husband is deceased. And the property is in both of their names. On the paperwork, it may say something like um, John and Josie um, owns this house, and now he's he's gone. How do I get John's <laughs> name off the policy or off the paperwork so that my will and desires are carried out? Since he's deceased. Okay, great question. Um, and the way I'm going to answer that is is this way. The first thing I would recommend you consider is titling it in the name as joint with rights of survivorship mm -hmm. rather than and. And the reason for that is it's a joint property with rights of survivorship which means that when one or the other person is deceased, mm -hmm. it automatically transfer okay. to the one that is still living. So this is, we, we talked about this, which is actually a good, a good segue into <laughs> this whole beneficiary planning. Could you restate that one more Joint time? with rights of survivorship. So J W. R O S is what you will see in a lot of the documentation whenever you're signing is joint with rights of survivorship. So this is a joint property with rights of survivorship. Whoever the survivor is, the property automatically transfers to that person. If it's listed as and, we get back to the probate thing, right? Because 50% of that property belongs to the deceased, which means it's got to go through the probate process. And as far as what you got to do, is once that happens, it depends on whether there's a mortgage on the property mm -hmm. <laughs> or whether it is free and clear. If it's free and clear, all you got to do is go down to the courthouse, take a death certificate, show their deceased, do a quick claim deed, get a change. If there's a mortgage, then you got to deal with the mortgage company because they, need, they want their money. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I've seen it. In several different ways, I've seen it where there, there was no, you know, life insurance proceeds and, and the people just had to keep paying it. And as far as the mortgage co is concerned, as long as you keep paying it, they're not going to bother you. So, and it'll stay in that name and it'll stay that way. But if you're not able to pay it or if you want to transfer it, then you've got to talk with the mortgage company and find out what their procedures are for getting it transferred. Because the thing they're going to be concerned about is, am I going to get my money? So before I allow you to do anything with this property, I need to know how I'm going to be paid. So in that instance, it may even require you to go back through 
um, a mortgage process, okay. getting a mortgage, paying that one off, that's a joint, and then just getting it in your name. Is there any um, opportunity for uh, an attorney or is there any opportunity for you to get an attorney or a lawyer to help you do that process? Absolutely. Okay. You can the, it's estate planning attorneys. That's that's what they do. Um, is to talk you through those processes. And 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 there may be times when that is necessary. Um, but what I will what I will say to that um, because we are talking about resources is right. understanding the process because some of the things that you can that they're going to charge you for <laughs> you can do for yourself. But if you have the assets to pay them, because we pay for convenience. If it's more convenient to just say, here, handle this, and I have the resources to do it, kind of like my yard man. That, that's a bill I'm going to have, because I like a nice yard, and I'm going to always pay him to come and take care of my yard. But the stuff that I can do for myself, I do for myself, right? So, But yes, ma'am, you can pay somebody to help you with that process. All right, so the question at hand is, are you familiar with prepaid legal? And if so, have you advised clients to use it? I have not advised clients to use it. And I'm just going to leave that right there. <laughs> I am familiar with it, and I have not advised clients to use it. Other questions? Suppose you were working with a paralegal. And and you had that problem there. Do you think that they would be skilled enough to get this? Uh, it's just by judgment. Right. right. It, it depends on what type of paralegal they are. If they are a paralegal working in with estate planning and they are trained, then absolutely a paralegal can do that work. Mm -hmm. But if they if they are criminal, you know, working criminal, they may not be versed on that. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's. Here's the thing about, um, and, and that's a, I appreciate you, these questions are just bringing so many other things up in my mind that's taking me all off the presentation, but working with, you know, anybody legal or anybody financial, there are degrees in varying financial professionals, right? There are people who all they do is sell insurance. That's what they do. There are people like me who have a fiduciary responsibility to my clients. And I can advise you on wealth management. Sometimes people who are only licensed to sell insurance will pass themselves off as people who are licensed to give you investment advice. You have to do your due diligence to know the difference. You have to ask those questions to understand their qualifications because I have had to correct a lot of people's financial matters because they were advised by somebody that wasn't skilled to give them the advice. And, and that, again, that is no indictment against anybody. That is just the truth of what happened. We, people pass themselves off as knowledgeable in areas where they are not. And it creates trouble for us because they sometimes tend to think that we are gullible and we are vulnerable. And just because they befriend us and say, we're our kind and I'm looking out for you, they may not necessarily be doing that. And so I am, I'm putting that out there because it's, it's, it's getting, to me, it's getting more... Um, it's hurting our community. It is harming our community. And we got to start talking about these things more. Um, and and I, I tell some of the, the younger um, folks who are in this industry that, that may just be, it's okay. if, if insurance is all you want to do, do that. But then be honest with people and tell them, that's, that's all I do. If, if you need more than that, then let me refer you to somebody who, just like I'm saying about the legal matter, I'm not an attorney. I can't do that. But I have made friends with and made resources, built my network, so that when people get serious about that, I know enough to tell you what I've told you, and I'm certain about what I've said to be the truth. But when you get beyond, you know, you say, okay, Roz, I'm ready to do this, I'm going to say, you're not talking to me. You're going to go over here and talk to these people. 
and you figure out which one of them you want to talk to because they all are well versed in getting this done. That's how we support each other. That's how we feel. All of us need to make money, right? All of us, if you don't work, you don't eat. That's what the Bible says. And so we all can specialize. The Bible tells us. He gave us all gifts. And, and in the Bible, they spoke specifically about the gifts for the ministry and preparing and equipping the saints for how to live in the earth. But it's the same thing outside of that. He equips all of us to do something. I tell my doctor clients and my, um, um, my attorney clients, I can't come and do nothing y'all do. But then y'all don't know about money the way I know about money. So that's how we work together, right? And that's how our community starts to thrive and grow when we start trusting each other enough to work in my space. This is my space. Nobody can challenge me in this financial space. I mean, they can, but they got to come for me because I know what I know right here. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not being, you know, prideful or haughty in saying that. I'm just saying that this is what I know I've been gifted to do. And so we all have got to do that, and we've got to start going to places to do that. So I, I got there by just saying, you know, a paralegal can, that, that knows what she knows or he knows, if it's about estate planning, then let them help you. It's just kind of like what well, the other thing I'm thinking about are, are doctors um, and the, um, what's, what's the, the, the nurses that's just under the doctors now? Nurse practitioners now. They can, they can do the same work that doctors can do. So if you don't necessarily need to see the doctor, the nurse practitioner can help you. But I wouldn't go to a registered nurse. <laughs> Not that they don't know. You know, because my sister-in-law is a registered nurse, and I declare she a nurse practitioner, and we have been pushing her, and thank God she is oh, she is back in school to be able to get the degree, because she does the work. But get the degree so you'll have it and, 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 and have the credentials for people to know that you have learned about it, you have the experience, and when you can learn about it and, and couple that with experience, it, what, it makes you more valuable, right? Yes. Okay, I don't got all off the, 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 the subject, but back to life insurance. Questions? Any, any other questions we got at this point? Um, life insurance and, and beneficiaries. We, we, we started that by just saying making sure that you've got your bank accounts, your cars. Um, I, I generally say to people when you have a car um, that you want it titled as you or somebody else because that helps with the transferring. Um, now, what that also does is give each of you equal access, so you don't want to put somebody on there as the or person who might go down to the DMV and sell a car and you not know anything about it. Because <laughs> that can happen. Has happened. And none of these scenarios that I'm giving you are not any that I hadn't already seen, right? <laughs> Um, but you want, you want to make sure that you list it that way for ease of transfer. Right? You want to have, you, you don't, I, I recommend that you don't necessarily have, some, have to have somebody on your bank accounts as a joint person. Understand the difference. If they're on your bank account as a joint person, they have equal access to your money. And when they go in the bank, you, you ain't going to be able to sell the bank. Well, I, I didn't tell you to give it to them. No, you didn't. But you put them on your account as joint. So the bank is not liable if they go in there and take all your money out. Can't get mad at the bank for that. Now, what you can do, though, is not put them on as joint, but put them on as payable on death. Because payable on death, transfer on death, they don't have access to anything until you're no longer here. So it's understanding... The language is understanding how these things should happen and how you should set them up. Because, again, we get in trouble a lot of times because we don't understand. And we set something up and we expect it that the bank or, or the other should have been doing something. And they don't have any obligation to do that. Right? And so, again, it's, it's just really understanding what that looks like and, and, and having a clear um, understanding of how these things are set up. Let's keep talking a little bit about the um, um, the beneficiary arrangements and, and how you can set those up with your life insurances. And, and let me say this here, um, you know, if you bought a life insurance 20 years ago, check your beneficiaries. Because 20 years ago, you might not have been married, you might have still been with your mom, 
this has happened. Man bought life insurance. He put his mom as a beneficiary. Got married. He deceased. He never changed it from his mom. Wife is out. She gets nothing. And if she hadn't been kind to mother-in-law, <laughs> I can't make mother-in-law give you nothing. <laughs> I can't do it, right? And, and matter of fact, I can't even talk to you. And I know, I know you and I, you sat in this meeting with me and her. I know we talked about it, but we talked about you guys making sure you got the beneficiaries right too. I can't even talk to you about this now. Puts me in a bad place, right? You got to deal with that. So get beneficiaries. That's a, that's a takeaway today. Go check it out. Who is listed on every account? At, at your jobs even. Because when you sign up, you've been working on your job 30 years. You signed that up 30 years ago. You getting ready to retire. And, and you didn't go back and look and see. So your 401k, your mama getting it. Not your family. All of that stuff is important. Look at it. Stop. Take the time. These are matters that we, we keep saying. We'll get to it. I'll get to it. I'll get to it. it. I'll get to it. And let me tell you, people are not getting to it. They're not, they're not even having the opportunity to get to it. And at that point, there is nothing that I can do. And families are losing homes because they can't make the payments on the property and they got $200,000 over here in an account. But they can't get to it. So I hope you hear the urgency of what I'm trying to get across to us today. We have to pay attention and get our financial houses in order. We're not going to be able to build wealth. We're not going to be able to have a legacy for our children's children if we are not intentional about this. You got, a, you got a purpose in your heart that I want to leave a legacy. I have people that say to me, Roz, I, I, you know, it doesn't matter when I'm gone, I'm going to be gone. I say, how selfish of you. How, how do you, because here's what you think, because you're not going to see Jesus with that kind of attitude. I don't know where you're going to end up, but if that is your posture, that is not a God posture. And you're not going to be able to stand before him with that kind of posture that I, it, look, it just, hey, y'all handle it. And you leave a mess back here. Sorry, I got off and contend, but y'all understand what I'm saying. This is, this, is, this is how passionate I am about this for us and our community. We got to get this stuff right. So make sure you, all of these things have, a, none of these things should be set up without a beneficiary. If you've got an IRA, whether it's a simple IRA or a SEP IRA, a 401k, a 403b, um, 457, a kiosk, whatever you have, whatever you own, every single account needs to have a beneficiary listed on it. Every single one of them. And if you're not sure, um, and, and, and not even, you know, because people sometimes will say, I'm just, I'm just going to make my estate the, the beneficiary. And you can do that. But here's why I might ask you to think differently about it. It's because if it's the estate is the account, it's got to go to the estate before anybody can do anything with it. In the meantime, the mortgage still got to be paid. There's going to be some expenses that come with cleaning up for you after your death. So life doesn't just stop because you're not here. And if you've got a car payment, the car payment still got to be paid. But if that money got to go into the estate first... You can't even give it. It's going to take 9 to 12 months to settle out the estate. So now your home is going in foreclosure because you can't be making the payments because the assets to do that with are tied up in the probate. So is, is all of this kind of making sense? you got to make sure you have outlined. And if they have, if they have beneficiaries, then it's just a matter of signing and filling out the claim form, whoever the beneficiary is. Fill out the claim form, the check is going to be deposited in your account or, or mailed to you and you deposit it in your account and then you can have access to that money, right? Um, I have a question. Yes. How does all of the, when, if your home is paid off, how does all of this outside stuff 
that you might have in maybe possibly in need of payment affect your clear home? No effect at all, because the home is free and clear. Yes. So it 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 doesn't it doesn't affect it at all if you're taking care of those things. Right. But back to the question of the young lady asked over here, if there is a car or something that needs to be paid for mm -hmm. and there's no assets to pay for it, mm -hmm. but the name is on the house, mm -hmm. then they're going to expect you to take a mortgage on the house to pay me my car payment. Because the assets is, is titling. Do, do you see why titling is so important? Mm -hmm. Do you see why having the, the right and, and not, not, not your... Um, because I've seen this happen, you know, my name is Rosalind Laverne Glenn. That is my legal name. My accounts may say Ros Glenn. No, it needs to say Rosalind Laverne Glenn. Because sometimes, especially where juniors and seniors and third and fourth and fifth get, that's where the, con I, I mean, because I, who, who are you talking about? <laughs> Which one of us? That's my name. <laughs> So make sure all of your stuff, your name means something. It means something. Use it. And it's okay if they call you. My, my grandma used to call me Biddy Folk, but that was her nickname for me. And I, I love that nickname. But on my legal documents, whatever is on your birth certificate, whatever is on your um, Social Security card, that is the name that they're going to go by. So if you didn't put your name on your driver's license that's on your birth certificate you're going to run into some problems all of that stuff has to be in order and fixed and when you get married <laughs> all of that stuff matters if you take on your husband's name or you don't take on your husband's name you got to take care of all of these things naming matters goes back to these beneficiaries because you leave the financial institutions and the court system to figure it out. It's a lot, isn't it? It's overwhelming, right? I have a, 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 something that I did when I was a child. I got my, um, my mom took me a, a social security card when I was 12 years old because they had a teen program working. And over the years, I changed my name almost everywhere I went. <laughs> the Social Security Administration finally caught up with me, and I had a uh, name that was Josetta Lanzetta blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I had a name, Josie something else way out there. And they sent me an alias letter. And the alias letter probably had about six or seven names on it, and they wanted to know which one. Who are you? <laughs> what is your name? <laughs> and so I had to, um, they had to change all of my history mm -hmm. from the time I started working from 12-year-old until I got to be a teenager mm -hmm. to get it straight. Yeah, yeah. But I was so thankful because now I can see yeah. why. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and here's the other thing, because back in the day, when we think about the history of our community, we didn't have legal day documents. We, we, we didn't have, you know, we, we weren't considered people. So we didn't have stuff that identified who we were. So even now, um, I, I, had, I had a client whose, whose last name she had been spelling one way all of her life. Because that's what she told, was told how to spell it. But when she started trying to apply, because it gets, it gets real serious when you start applying for Social Security and any kind of benefits from the government, now they want to really make sure that you are who you are, right? And, and so you're spelling it one way here, but all the documents say this is what it is. So now you got to go through the process of proving who you are. So get that stuff in order, right? Get it in order now and make sure that you have those things in place, right? Um, I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm preaching because I am, because it's really that serious. Because it can hinder 
the benefits that you are qualified for. Um, and, and I'm not suggesting that, you know, because we get in, you know, everybody, we, we pay into Social Security. I'm not one of those people who think Social Security is going away and it's never going to be here. I do know that we need to make some significant changes to it because people are taken out of Social Security who never put into it. And so there are some changes that need to be made um, and, and, and in order to sustain it. Um, but it matters. It will matter when it comes your time for you to qualify for it, right? And so we got to think about those things and make sure you have all of your stuff in order um, and, and have it have it set up properly. Um, we've talked about, again, the importance of making sure that you have your beneficiaries right, particularly on uh, what we call qualified money. And qualified money generally is retirement dollars. And the reason we call those dollars qualified money is because you haven't paid taxes on that money. You were able to earn it and you didn't pay taxes on it. It was put in your account and you didn't pay taxes on it. Um, but when you take it out, at the point that you get ready to take it out, now you got to pay taxes on it. <laughs> and we're getting closer to the, my clock is different from that one back there. It says 10 minutes. So we're getting closer to the end. And I'm yeah, I'm wrapping up. I'm wrapping up. Um, so 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 I, I wanted to mention that whole thing about um, you know, Social Security and retirement and how that all is impacted and making sure that you have your names and stuff right, making sure that your beneficiaries are right, um, talking about whether or not you need to set up a trust, um, know, making sure you know the rules. That's really a, about making sure that you know the rules. Uh, around the different types of accounts that you have um, and what those look like. Um, and again, I'll just put in my shameless plug for working with somebody that can help you walk through this stuff. It, it's a lot for me, and I'm, I'm required to know it. And I, I've studied and got the licenses to know it, which is why I know for the average person, there's no way you can know it. There's no way for you to know this stuff, um, but we got to know it. It's, it's, it's important information. And we got to make sure that we know that. I, because we only have about eight minutes left, I'm going to kind of stop talking for a second and just see, do we have any questions about anything? We've talked a lot about a lot today. Um, I hope you found something beneficial in your packets. Um, I'm going to go back to all of this. Having a sound financial footing starts with having a budget and telling your money what you want it to do for you rather than letting your money tell you what you can do. And I believe we put some budget worksheets in your packets. If you don't, if we didn't and you want one, I have some with me. Um, we also put in there the cornerstones of financial planning. Um, and I encourage you to take a look at that because all of those things matter um, and, and need to be addressed as, as you are talking about what your financial situation is and, and, and being intentional about developing it. Understanding how your employer benefits work and how you can take advantage of that. We're in open enrollment season now in a lot of companies. Do not just say, do what I did last year. Look at what you have available to you and take advantage of the things that you can take advantage of to help you. Because you, you'd be surprised at some of the benefits. They may not be paying you a whole lot, but they may be offering to pay for free gyms. Uh, a free gym membership or or some cases they may even uh, uh, through your employee assistance program they may allow you to get a, a simple will done at no cost so understand the benefits that you have available to you as a part of your um, employers program um, and get life insurance and not just a $25,000 policy to bury you with understand what your liabilities are put something in place of course, the older you are, the more it's going to cost. So it may be cost prohibitive now for some of you. But then ha let's have the conversation and get something in place so that you don't leave your families in a pickle, having to do a GoFundMe account or Cash App or something, or worse yet, get put in a pine bat box in the backyard because nobody has any money. Right? So put these things in place and talk to your children about it now. Because you're li you've lived it. Some of us have lived it, and we know. So if we let our children go the same path, then shame on us. And they may, not, they may appear not to be listening, but tell them anyway. Tell them anyway. 
Because something will click one day and they'll want to make the change and get things in order, particularly when they have to deal with you and your stuff. That'll make somebody try to get their stuff in, in order pretty quickly. That, that's how I'm, I, I got clients coming to me, seem like out of the woodworks, because they like, I, I can't go through this, and I don't want my children to go through this. So, Roz, help me get it in order, because I know what stress is causing me having to deal with my parents, and I don't want that stress on my children. So thank you all so much for letting me come. I get more excited the more I talk. Um, I hope that, that you guys have gotten something that you can take away. Um, and as Sister Josie said, um, I won't be talking the next time, but I'm going to bring some of my friends along who are going to be giving you more in-depth information about the things that we have talked about. And I want to be a resource for you guys. So please call me. You have my um, access to me. Um, please call my office. I have a whole team of people that I am training to work with you all like I work with clients because I believe this matters and it is important. And I also believe that the Lord is he's preparing to transfer the wealth of the wicked to the just and he needs some people ready to handle it. And so I'm preparing us to handle it. All right? My phone number is, I'll give you my office number. I thought it was on one of those sheets, but let me give it to you. It is 803-250-4795. That's my office number. Best number to try to get me. Um, I am there. Um, my office hours are 9 to 5. I will usually take my last appointment around 6.30 each day. Um, I have a team. My office manager, her name is Lynn Scott. She normally handles and schedules my appointments for me. Um, and then I have two members, Devin Barnes and um, LJ Summers, who assist me in providing um, the services that we try to provide to our team. Um, and so, and I'm looking for some additional um, help of, of licensed folk who can come and help us do this work because it's, 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 it's a lot of work that needs to be done um, and we are trying to position ourselves to be a resource to our community in this way. So we would love the opportunity to work with you. Thank you all so much. Proverbs 1322a, a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. This verse keeps our life goals, our vision, and our legacy front and center when we are choosing how to use our money today. This conference today does that also. And we thank you so much for spending the time with us. We feel your passion. We hear your passion and we thank the Lord for your commitment to the body of Christ and to the community. And we pray that he will continue to bless you and continue to strengthen you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just a few. Just a few housekeeping notes. We do have carryouts for everyone and probably your family. Um, if you'd like to, Tamara will assist us with having some box lunches to take with us with what we had today. And I want to thank you for your participation in this conference and we look forward to 2023 for our next uh, conference. And uh, it will probably not be the last one that we will have. I think that this is a journey that we must take together. There's a lot of information that we didn't get to today, but we will be looking at those final decisions that we make in the next conference. And I thank you uh, for being here today. And let us thank the Lord because he has used his servant today to pour out so much information that's going to be useful toward our destiny and for the long-term life that he's given each one of us and the eternal positioning of ourselves for our inheritance that we're going to leave for our children and our grandchildren. Father, we do thank you. We praise you, Lord God, 
because you are a foreseer. You see our future, Lord God. Father, it is your hand that is stretched out toward the future for us, Lord God, at these present times, during the time of, of the pandemic and during the time of COVID and during the transitioning of our family members, when, God, we were so unprepared. But, God, you knowing all things, Lord God. Father, I believe your word, Lord God, that shows us, God, that the your hand is strong upon us and we believe by faith God that you have sent your servant to just give us what we need you said God that you were going to supply all of our needs from your riches in glory by Christ Jesus and we see the evidence God of your goodness all over our lives and you've brought us to this day and this point Lord God so that you can prepare us, God, because it's all on you. And we thank you, Father. Now, Father, you told us in your word to bless your people. And, Father, we pray that you bless them. God, that you would just keep them. Father, that when they come to you, Lord God, that your face will shine upon them, Lord. And, Father, with that fine shining face Lord God that you have God that you will be gracious unto each one of us and with your grace and your mercy and God your ultimate love toward us that we will have the peace that Jesus gave us in all of our transitions in all of our transactions Lord God that we face doing that we will have peace about engagements with our finances and our money and all the things that you have given us to be good stewards over, Lord God. And Father, when we come to you and we pray that you would lift up your countenance unto us, God, because you hear our prayers. And you will allow us another day to walk in your presence and in your peace, the peace that will surpass all understanding. And we pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You're dismissed. Please stop and get your carry out. <laughs> Some more. <laughs> as much as you can. And look, and I'm going to come as often as I can. Right? Sure.